goal we had talked about was talking, uh, discussing like client and uh, healer experiences of consciousness work or of yeah. that kind of conscious container. So I think we'll we'll get to that. I think to frame it, I did want to see if if there's uh, is there a way you would con uh, contrast the dimension approach with other approaches as far as what kind of comes up during consciousness work that other modalities may not uh, elicit or foster. So I was talking some last time about about how I work with what's happening in, in real time or in, in linear time as opposed to uh, digging for past memories or something. But that said, conscious mirroring, I feel like to answer that, I got to kind of get into this idea of of conscious mirroring, which I think is, a, is not an, a well-understood concept at all. There's a book that I that I have a reference to on my website um, about conscious mirroring. That book says it says it fairly well. So this idea that there's a that, that there's the conscious mind, and if you if you just put it in energetic terms, if the conscious mind is a is an energy center, and and energy centers function as organs of experience right in our head there's this energy center that is the conscious mind and in our head an energy center that let's just say is the ego mind or is the intellect or the cognitive mind conceptual mind all those terms can be applied the ego mind is a mechanism that registers and interprets organizes data, sensory data that comes in from all these different, all these other energy centers. So physical data, emotional data, sexual data, mental data. And the general modern orientation or, or organization of, of our psyche is that we, we orient from that cognitive energy center that ego center, we orient our attention from it primarily. We experience it as an object in our awareness that we also experience as self. So we're aware from it, of it, and as it, which is a dangerous mode to be in. It's a recipe for depression and anxiety. It's a recipe for narcissism, recipe for idealism. And the general idea is that if you go back in history, people used to orient their attention more from body. And by body, I mean the energies themselves, the feelings the spirits they were possessed by, so to speak, which sounds fantastical, but the idea is that, that it, it correlates with the individual lifespan, that the child, prior to arriving at a certain cognitive awareness of oneself, there's just this living out the various urges, moves, drives, desires, archetypes, spirits, entities, you know, whatever kind of words you want to use. And you just, you just are that, right? You're possessed by that. You're just, you're just immersed in that experience and living it out. And there's not cognitive reflection on that. There's not ego awareness that translates those experiences into conceptual frameworks. And we all, of course, go into those experience moment to moment throughout the day, no matter how cognitively organized we are. We have those experiences, but we also have this cognitive mechanism that is, that is there managing things. That cognitive mechanism isn't necessarily the source of absolute truth. 
and it's not the source of actual self. And so the, the separation from a feeling of nature, a feeling of body, a feeling of embodiment, a feeling of connectedness is largely due to the separating out that we do with our cognitive mind. So everything becomes conceptual as opposed to direct and actual. I think it even plays out in our language, you know, the use of the term like, right? We, we, we live in these modes where, where everything is like something. It's not even, we can't even directly talk about it. We have to put the word like into everything because we're experiencing everything as if or, or like it's, it's like this. It was like that. When you sort of look at that, at it that way, you can, you can see that it's someone, it's someone that we live in this experience again, that's, that's kind of an as if because we don't, we don't, we're not directly in there. So that distinction between nature, body, and mind, intellect, cognition, etc. Th those are two different categories. So the third category is consciousness, soul, spirit, essence, ontological reality, which of course some people don't even think is, you know, is real. But so of course I'm coming from a place where it's real and awakening, right? Consciousness work in general awakening, enlightenment, realization, actualization is about shifting one's awareness to being aware from, of, and as the conscious mind or the conscious self. So there's this interplay between the two constantly. No one is, no one is 100% disconnected from consciousness and only being aware from ego or at least not for very long, if, if one is aware just from ego, from the ego mind, it's very, very dark. The ego mind absent consciousness is darkness. If you stick with the uh, physical analogy around this stuff, that consciousness is light, awareness is space, and matter is ego, you know, the analogy works in that the earth minus light minus the sun is pitch black right it's not a self-illuminating thing it's pitch black and we experience that obviously as soon as the earth rotates to where the sun's on the other side of where you're at it's, it goes pitch black so the the earth is pitch black without the sun and the ego if the ego mind is earth and the conscious mind is the sun, the ego mind is illuminated by the conscious mind, but the ego mind operating on its own is dark. If you just kind of take that simple model, the way I work and the way a, a lot of approaches work, I, you know, as I keep saying, I, th I think it, all the approaches eventually come back to the, to the kind of thing I'm talking about that suffering is a result of a disconnection from consciousness and an, and of being stuck in, in ego. It's, it's being stuck in darkness. And just like, you know, as powerful as the sun is, it can be blocked out and we can experience darkness. All you got to do is close your eyes. All you got to do is, you know, create some shade and the sun is blocked out. So we experience darkness, and if and if, if you think of it that way, that okay, suffering is the experience of darkness, but the truth is the sun has not gone out. If you're experiencing darkness, that doesn't mean the sun is gone. It means it's blocked. So whatever isolation, disconnection, rejection, forsakenness, et cetera, et cetera, we, we may feel the truth is the sun has not abandoned us. It's that th there's something going on that is, that is in the way of our direct experience of it. Starting from there, when I'm working with someone, whatever it is they are suffering, 
my first first step, first thought, you know, my my orientation is okay. Can I use my conscious mind, which shines light? Can I use mine to shine light on the place in their psyche where they're experiencing darkness? Which means, if you put it in mental emotional terms, it means can I see, tolerate, accept, empathize, be with the experience, the thought, the feeling, the vibration that that person's having? Can I remain conscious in the midst of the experience that they are struggling to remain conscious in? To the extent that I can, then I can be. A help to them. We can get into the to the various phases of that and the different relational dynamics that can go on in that process because it's usually not just as simple as here. Let me shine light on it. There you go. Doesn't that feel better? Because it's really the process isn't complete until that person's consciousness can now illuminate that part of their psyche they may feel temporary relief and often do when they're connecting with me and i'm shining light on it you know and they often report that okay when they leave my office that relief goes away they either decide well that didn't work or they you know decide i need to get back in and get another appointment as soon as possible i'm always working with the goal of helping them get to where they can consciously be present with in, in that part of their psyche. And, and when that happens, they no longer, they no longer need me. So if I try to come back around to answering your question, you still there, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. I'm still here. <laughs> so I'm saying, okay, a person's suffering in a certain way, they ha- they have some kind of symptom, physical, emotional, mental, etc. And th- they're presenting that symptom to me. To a certain extent, they name it or they talk about it or describe it. But far more than what their cognitive mind is naming, I'm feeling into and looking with my conscious mind at what's going on and noticing intuitively sensing uh, where the the quote-unquote problem is so they may come in and say i get headaches or i struggle with depression or my knee hurts and it's like okay i certainly want that information and use that information but i'm feeling into okay what's going on in their body in their subtle field in their mind and and what's the relationship between their conscious mind in these various places? And, and what's the overall pattern? And by pattern, I mean blocking of their consciousness from this part of their psyche. And then the sitting with, being present with, holding space for, like containing, eventually mirroring, um, in an attempt to undo the pattern. In the process of that, a lot of different things can come up. The nature of it is that the person is blocking conscious awareness from the area for a reason. They're usually no longer aware of the reason. They're no longer aware of what area of the psyche it is that's being blocked. They're not aware of how it is they're blocking it. All they know is they have this symptom. And in the process of getting their conscious attention back in contact with that part of their psyche, to varying degrees, they become aware of what it was they were blocking, why they were blocking it. But it's to varying degrees. It's not necessarily that they, they have a cognitive memory of a certain event. It's not that they necessarily cognitively register all the nuances of the emotions that were involved in the trauma, etc. 
It's what actually registers in the client's ego mind with regard to c conceptual understanding of what's going on in their system. Th that varies a lot. And in general, what registers cognitively for us, as I've said before, in, at any given moment, is such a minuscule amount of information in relation to the total amount of information that our system is processing. You know, it's like with a computer, if you, if you use the computer analogy, what's actually showing up on, on your computer screen is just one little part of all the processes that are happening in the computer. The screen doesn't show every little last detail, obviously, of, of what's happening. And when we, when we do, you know, it, it's kind of like that we can go into certain states where we do start to register some information in our system that isn't our usual way of registering information. And it, and it can be quite disturbing in the same way that with a computer, you know, you can, you can hit some buttons and find yourself looking at a bunch of HTML code on your screen. And it's like, oh my God, what the hell just happened? Something went terribly wrong. And it's like, okay, take it easy, take it easy. That, that there's actually an, uh, you know, an, an organization to all that stuff right there. And if you're not a computer programmer, you probably shouldn't go in there and try to alter a bunch of that. But it is supposed to be there. You don't need to delete that file. And you don't need to try to make that file or, or that content you're seeing on the screen right now. You don't need to change it to look like what it, whatever it was you were trying to bring up on your screen. Because there's these layers to it. And our psyche's like that. And I'm saying that, the, for example, the imaginal layer looks a certain way that does not look or feel or behave the way rational, conceptual information looks in our mind, which does not look the same way that emotion does, which does not look the same way that physical sensation does, which does not look the way that spiritual conscious experience does. So the cognitive mind is there doing its thing, registering, interpreting, organizing, making up stories. It varies in a huge way, moment to moment, client to client, as far as what's actually showing up there versus to what extent is a client capable of directly experiencing emotion, for example, instead of just translating it into thought. Registering these different experiences it's kind of like learning different languages, you know. It, it's easy to just interpret everything into the language of of logic, for example. It's a real exercise in in uh, it's a real meditative type of exercise to to consciously discern the difference between a direct sensation, a perception, an emotion, an imaginal experience, a conscious experience. Uh, from from one another and in consciously doing that you're doing the dimension approach which is bringing consciousness to a dimension right the, the reason i call it the dimension approach is because i'm using the word dimension in a real general way to say every every different experience every context that we might have an experience in is is really a different dimension in the in the mind different dimension in the psyche different dimension in the body and it's a way of you know trying to name and and be able to separate out how it works because again to use the computer analogy the way i experience it and see other people experience it it's very similar to a computer in that we seem to have this this screen this mind screen that has different stuff show up on it. And what shows up on the mind screen is what we become ego aware of. But what shows up on that screen it varies a lot. And there's these different windows that open up. So if a, if a window on your computer, on your computer screen is analogous to a dimension of experience, 
it's like, well, we can open up, you know, infinite different windows and a, a huge shift in my understanding of, of consciousness and experience and, and different maladies came when I realized so much miscommunication, so much turmoil, so much stuckness is a result not so much of a problem with the content in a particular window, but rather a problem with regard to which window is being opened up, which window is, is stuck in a maximized state on the mind screen, which windows won't open for someone. That's a whole different game than let's try to reorganize the contents within a certain window. So again, that's why I call it the dimension approach. It's let's look at the dimensions rather than the content in the dimension. Let's stay in the conscious mode because it's the conscious mind that can see, oh, that's that dimension, that's that dimension, right? The ego mind just takes whatever dimension is, is whatever windows on the screen as the all, you know, as true, as real. It's like, well, it's on my screen. That must be the, the whole truth. That must be the reality. And it's like, no, that's just, that's just a particular window that's showing up on your screen. You know, if you come back to yourself sitting here listening to this right now, it's like whatever you're experiencing right now, you're just, you're just looking at that dimension. You're just, you just have that window open up or, or that set of windows is open on your screen at the moment. And you can choose. We have the potential to get more and more able to consciously choose. I'm going to close that window. I'm sick of that window right now. I'm, I'm not going to sit and fixate and obsess and be plagued by that window. And you know what? I don't even have to fix the contents of that window. I just need to frickin' close it, which is a different thing than denial or, or dissociation. But the, the ability to recognize what windows are up in my mind screen and why and how do I get conscious control of it? How do I open the right windows to perform a certain task, which is what the performance work is about? How do I become conscious of what's going on with the windows? That's what the consciousness work is about. If you want to learn more about the Dimension Approach, please visit dimensionapproach.com.